Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, uh, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Be sure to cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. And uh, follow us over on Twitter at Radio Detectives. Uh, before we do get started, I want to say uh, thank you uh, to Michael uh, Galea. Uh, and also, uh, to Heidi, uh, for their, uh, uh, kind, uh, donations and support of the program. Uh, if you want to take part in our listener support campaign to help support the show, go to support.greatdetectives.net. We also have a, a wide variety of different great digital thank you gifts, including full cast, uh, audio dramas featuring Perry Mason and Poirot as well as some high-fidelity old-time radio recordings are uh, available. Uh, go to support.greatdetectives.net. The deadline is Saturday, September 10th, so it's this coming Saturday. Well, a somewhat sad uh, moment that this episode will mark not only our last episode with Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes, but our last episode with Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson. And we've been hearing uh, Nigel Bruce, with the exception of a couple of weeks he was uh, sick, longer than anybody other than Bob Bailey and uh, Let George do it. And he definitely brought a uh, certain something uh, to the role, a warmth, I think, that in my mind uh, made up for any other deficiencies. So for the last time, savor the performance of the great Nigel Bruce and with Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes in The Adventure of the Iron Maiden. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now let's drop in on Sherlock Holmes' friend and ours, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. Here you are. Come and sit down. Thank you. I trust that you'll join me in a glass of port. I think I'd better. If only to fortify myself against the horrors of the story you promised us for this evening. The adventure of the Iron Maiden, you called it. Well, yes, Mr. Bell. For your last visit of the season, I promised you one of our most macabre adventures. And as soon as you've had a word with our listeners, I'll tell you about the Iron Maiden, or as she was known in Nuremberg, the Eisner Jungfrau. Men, on hot summer days, does your hair get out of hand and look dry, wild, and unruly? After a swim, does it feel sticky and stringy, so matted and tangled? Then remember, Kreml hair tonic keeps dry, wild, sun-baked hair looking perfectly groomed throughout the hottest, stickiest day, as if your barber had just combed it. You see, Kreml contains a special combination of hair-grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This wonderful, natural-looking hairdressing has just enough light oil to keep hair neatly groomed with an attractive, healthy-looking luster. Yet Kreml never leaves the hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. Kreml always looks and feels so clean on both hair and scalp. It leaves the scalp feeling so cool, refreshed, and alive. So make Kreml a daily must this summer for that handsome, clean-cut look from morning till night. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, I'm sure we're all as anxious as I am to hear the strange story of the Iron Maiden. Well, it was just before the turn of the century, and Holmes and I had brought to a successful completion the most delicate mission for the reigning family of Saxony. We were spending a day of relaxation in the picturesque old German town of Nuremberg, preparatory to a leisurely trip on the Rhine, and then back to England. As we were getting up from breakfast in our rooms in the hotel... Holmes said, Wonderful weather, Watson. And I see you're admiring the excellent view of this quaint old town from our window. View? Oh, yes, I suppose the view's all right. You don't sound very enthusiastic. I'm not. You know what the trouble with Germany is, Holmes? No. What? It's full of Germans. Hmm? Huh? Must be the waiter. Come in, come in, come in. 
Yes, I the honor of addressing Mr. Sherlock Holmes of London, England. Uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes, sir. My name is Watson. Dr. Watson. Oh, yeah, Mr. Holmes, so celebrated colleague. Oh, very good, eh? <laughs> uh, permit me that I introduce myself, gentlemen. My name is Ferdinand Langer. Yes, Mr. Langer. Uh, my friend, the chief porter of this hotel, told me of your arrival. And I have come to, to beg of you if perhaps you can help me with my so difficult problem. If it is a matter for the police, Mr. Langer, I fear that I shall be unable to assist you. I have no uh, official standing here. And besides, Dr. Watson and I will be leaving tomorrow. Oh, the police. To the police I have been, Mr. Holmes. At me they laugh. I, I am, uh, how do you say, a chief keeper of the fifth Egger term. Uh, what? The five-cornered tower of the oh. castle of Nuremberg. Oh, oh, you have heard oh. of it? Of course. And of its famous torture museum. Uh, torture museum? That sounds distinctly unpleasant. For 35 years now I work in the tower. In the last 18 years I am chief keeper. All this time, there is never a complaint about me. But now, these last few weeks, the letters have started to come. Each one with more awful threatenings. Threats, Mr. Langer? Threats of what? That too old I am getting. That I should resign my position. That if I do not, something terrible will happen. Here, here is the latest for yourself. You shall see, Mr. Holmes. Ah, yes. Hmm. If my knowledge of German serves me... Vague threats, nothing specific, quite a typical letter. Uh, from the irregularity of the handwriting, Mr. Langer, the slanting lines and certain other definite characteristics, I'd say that the writer of this letter is definitely unbalanced. Ah, oh, you, you mean mad, Holmes? Uh, perhaps not outwardly so, but most definitely abnormal. And from the fact that these threats are evidently designed to make you resign your position, Mr. Langer, I deduce that the author of them must be connected in some way with the affairs of the tower. Have you any suspicions? Uh, this I do not like to say, Mr. Holmes. But there is a young man, my assistant, Heinrich Schiller, who but waits to step into my shoes. He even presumes to pay court to my daughter Elsa. Oh, well, 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 we're, we're only young ones, Mr. Langer. Oh, my daughter, I have better things in mind than this insolent young man. Oh, well. So, you too, Mr. Holmes, think Heinrich wrote these letters? You think I should have him arrested or dismissed? I think you'll require more evidence than a mere guess, Dr. Langer. But how shall I get it? Well, perhaps we might combine business with pleasure. What do you say, Watson? Suppose we have Mr. Langer show us through Nuremberg's most famous site, the Five-Cornered Tower. <laughs> gentlemen. If you will just follow me through this gate here. This way, gentlemen. Uh, just a moment, my man. Are you in charge here? Yes, madam. Then why are these people being admitted to the tower, while my friend Miss Simpson and I are kept standing about and demarred, debarred from entrance? Oh, do please be careful, Amelia. It isn't as though we were home. Nonsense. I insist upon knowing. I am sorry, madam, but the tower is not open for visitors until 11 each morning, as you will find if your Baedeker you will consult. And it is now but 10 o'clock. Then why are these two men being admitted? Uh, because... No they... excuses. I'm English, my man. And in England, we believe in fair play. No favoritism. I'm sure, Mr. Langer, that you have no objection to showing these two charming ladies through the tower with us. Oh, of course, Mr. Holmes, if you say so. I do indeed. Thank you very much, sir. Just what I should expect from a fellow Britisher. A pleasure. After you, ladies. Lead the way, Mr. Langer. At this point, in the very center of the castle we are, cut from out of the solid rock built by the prisoners from 1253 till 60 years later. 1253? Victoria, 
Be canoe to that. What in heaven's name is that black pit yawning in the center over the... The tiefer brunnen. The deep well. Lean over and listen while I drop a stone. It must be almost possible. About um, 340 feet, I'd say. You have been here before, Mr. Holmes? No, I merely counted the interval from the time you dropped the stone until the splash. Oh, Amelia, down that corridor, look. That gigantic shadow. It's getting nearer. Oh, no, 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 no. Control yourself, madam. It's merely somebody approaching with a torch. Ah, uh, good morning, Herr Langer. I did not know you were showing a party through so early. That is Heinrich, Mr. Holmes. Follow with us, Heinrich. Yes, sir. Here are the dungeon cells, where we kept the prisoners. It's most insanitary, I call it. Nothing but damp stone. Barbaric. Just what I should expect of foreigners. And here... The torture chamber. What are all those strange objects? Oh, at least there's a couch for the poor prisoners. Uh, hardly that, I fear. That uh, wheel-like object at the head of it proclaims its true purpose. Yeah, Mr. Holmes. This was the rack. On it, they would tie the victim, and with the wheel, they would stretch and stretch and stretch his limbs until his bones cracked. Oh, how awful. Come, come, Victoria. No weakness. Oh, pleasant idea, I must say. What's that iron collar thing up, up there? Oh, that, Doctor, fits into that larger iron frame which over there you may see. Around the neck of a prisoner, it was snapped and locked, so that the unfortunate man neither sit nor lie down nor sleep could. Regular chamber of horrors. And there is the boot, the iron frame in which a prisoner's leg was slowly crushed, and the braziers for melting lead and heating tongs and pincers. They are all here. And uh, that large iron affair beneath the embrasure, that, Mr. Langer... I assume to be a famous Iron Maiden. The Iron Maiden? It looks just like a statue. Yes, I can't say that I consider it a very beautiful one. It is a statue, madam, but a hollow one. <laughs> and for good reason. I, I think I'd rather not hear about it. Victoria, keep a stiff upper lip. The two halves of the statue swing open, and within are many iron spikes, as in the moment you will see. Into it was placed the victim, and slowly, slowly the door upon him was closed. The maiden's kiss, the executioners called it. Oh, imaginative bunch of fellows they must have been. A most graphic description, Mr. Langer. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, perhaps one of the ladies would like to open the statue and see Vidi. Oh, no, not I. Nonsense, Victoria. The ghosts of prisoners who have been dead for 500 years can't hurt you. Uh, here, uh, Mr. Guide, I'll open it. Go. You lift this bar here, so, and then pull open with this handle. Uh, it, it works rather stiffly. There, now it's opening. Ah! Good heavens. Oh, oh. There's something inside. The body of a woman. No, oh, don't touch her. Mr. Holmes, the letters. Something horrible they spoke of. Now it has happened. Here, it's unbelievable. Control yourself, Victoria. Schiller, take these two ladies out into the air. Yes, sir. Now, yes. chin up, my dear. Chin up. Lean on me if you like. But chin up. Oh, I must say, Holmes, that's about a, as nasty a sight as I've ever seen. Quite so, Watson. Mr. Langer. Do you recognize this woman? <laughs> Never saw her before. What time yesterday did the last visitors go through? The museum is closed from six o'clock on, Mr. Holmes. Then the body of this unfortunate young woman must have been placed here between that time last night and the present moment. Yeah, but how I cannot understand. Now, at last, to me, the police will have to listen. Undoubtedly. And you'd best send for them at once. Dr. Watson and I will be leaving Nuremberg tomorrow morning. And the authorities will no doubt wish to take our statement. Immediately, I shall send for them. We shall wait here for their arrival. Oh, this scandal. It will wreck the museum. Uh, Mr. Holmes, you have seen Heinrich. Tell me, could he so terrible a thing have done? That, Mr. Langer, is a question we had best leave to the police. I fetched them at once. A curious problem, Watson. The solution is, of course, obvious. To solution? Uh, this murder, you mean? Murder? There's been no murder, Watson. What the devil do you mean, Holmes? 
with the corpse literally staring us in the face from inside that revolting iron statue. If you will examine the corpse for a moment, my dear Watson, you'll notice that it exhibits no signs whatsoever of rigor. By Jove, you, you're right. But what on earth does it mean? Simply that this poor woman was dead long before her body was put into the Iron Maiden. I've no doubt that the police will quickly be able to establish that a corpse is missing from the morgue or one of the local hospitals. But Holmes, what can be the purpose of so fiendish and so horrible a plot? I hardly expect you to tell me it's merely a practical joke. Far from it. Madness lay at the bottom of those letters that Langer showed us. And madness placed this body within the statue. But the difficulty, Watson, will be to reveal the madman behind these acts. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes as he endeavors to solve the mystery of the Iron Maiden. Men, on hot, sticky summer days, your hair needs extra special care. And when you buy a hair tonic, why not buy one that does lots more than just keep hair looking handsome? Why not get your money's worth and buy Kremel hair tonic? No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly groomed and attractive looking. Kremel gives hair such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. It keeps the hair perfectly groomed throughout the hottest, stickiest day. It never looks or feels greasy or sticky. In addition, Kremel is simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes itchy, loose dandruff and leaves the scalp feeling so clean, refreshed, and alive. No wonder Kremel is preferred among America's most prosperous men. Buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use this highly specialized hair tonic daily. For better groomed hair, a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what did Sherlock Holmes do to uncover the madman behind the strange deed in the five-cornered tower of Nuremberg? Well, by the time that the police had finished with us, it was late in the afternoon. Considerably shaken by the events of the day, we returned to our hotel, where the two ladies who had spent so grim a morning with us were also stopping. After a tub and a whiskey and soda, I don't know which was more welcome, I came back into our room to find Holmes in conversation with young Heinrich Schiller. Anything I can do, Mr. Holmes, I will. I know that the police suspect me of these letters, and how can I prove that I did not write them? Elsa's father shows clearly that he thinks it is I behind all this horror. If you will carry out my instructions, Mr. Schiller... I think we may succeed in clearing up this matter this evening. Heaven bless you, Mr. Holmes. If only you can remove the shadow that hangs over Elsa and myself. Mm, yes. And uh, now goodbye. Until later. Goodbye, gentlemen. Goodbye. Hmm. That young fellow looks as though he was at his wit's end. If the police, the father of the girl you loved, and even the girl herself suspected you of being an anonymous letter writer with a latent streak of insanity... I'd uh, greatly doubt that even you could maintain your usual poise. Possibly. But I wouldn't write anonymous letters or put corpses in iron maidens. I trust not. Well, I'm ready to do, to do good justice to a great dinner and then a good night's sleep before we start our trip down the Rhine tomorrow. I hope that the dinner will be good. But I'm sorry to tell you that your chances of a good night's sleep look extremely poor. Oh? Why? Because by ten o'clock this evening, you and I must be securely hidden in the torture room of the castle. Oh, really? Uh, quite. And before we dine, I'd be obliged if you would unpack your service revolver and make certain that it's loaded. We may well be depending upon you before the night is out. For just a moment. Where are you off to? I'm going downstairs to see Miss Atterbury. I'll meet you in the dining room. That grim-faced old trout? Well, don't tell me you're going to ask her and that mousy little companion of hers to, to dine with us. Not at all, my dear fellow. I want Miss Atterbury's assistance in baiting a trap. So there, Miss Atterbury, you have a frank statement of my problem. I understand, Mr. Holmes. The difficulty, you see, is that although the man in question is uh, undoubtedly as mad as a hatter, there's no way in the world by which I can prove it. And uh, what I fear is that, uh, having begun with threatening letters and uh, graduated to stolen bodies, his mania may at any time break out in an even more violent form. Oh, Mr. Holmes, you don't mean... 
Murder? Don't be idiotic, Victoria. Of course, Mr. Holmes means murder. Oh! If you are willing to take the risk, Miss Atterbury, it is my belief that um, a sudden and violent shock may serve to bring his madness into the open. But um, I'll not disguise from you the fact that although Dr. Watson and I will take every precaution, you may still be running a considerable personal risk. Don't do it, Amelia. This is no concern of yours. Think what the dear vicar would say. The vicar would probably faint. I, however, am made of sterner stuff. Mr. Holmes? I shall be glad to assist you to the best of my ability. Capital. Then I shall see you at about 11 o'clock tonight, Miss Atterbury. Although uh, you will not see us. Clock holes. I feel as though we've been here most of the night. Cold dampness of this infernal torture chamber is like a breath from a tomb. I only hope, Watson, that my estimate of our man's psychology has been accurate. I'd hate to think that I'd put Miss Atterbury into jeopardy unnecessarily. Well, she looked to me the sort of female who could take care of herself if she were charged by a mad elephant. Nothing wrong with her courage, though. There are not many women who would. Hear that, Watson? Yes, yes, yes. I hear them. Now you understand why I point the hour of eleven. The moon has risen, and enough of her light comes through that narrow embrasure so that you can shoot straight if the need arises. I have my revolver ready, Holmes. Be in readiness for anything, Watson. Once they're in this room, we shan't be able to make the slightest sound. Right you are. Right you are. You are sure, Miss Atterbury, that no one knows about this visit? No. I made a point of telling nobody. Good. Only because you have shown such great interest and been so understanding, would I through the tower show you at night when the museum is closed? It's too good of you, my dear Mr. Langner. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Uh, but I did so want to see it by moonlight. Uh, when I get back to England, I know I shall be the envy of all my friends. It's because the proper spirit you show to the memories of the old days that I bring you here now. It is best at night. Those who once screamed aloud in this room, almost you imagine that in the moonlight, you can see them. <laughs> and hear them. Oh, really, Mr. Langer, you have the most remarkable ability for summoning up the ghosts of the past. When I think of what this room must have known... It makes the cold shivers run down my spine. Ah, it is because you have the imagination that you so feel. That is but right and proper. I was so disappointed today when you were unable to complete your description of all these fascinating devices. There is no reason why now you should not them all be seen. Uh, that pair of objects hanging on the wall there, uh, they look almost like gloves hanging at the end of those iron chains. <laughs> <laughs> they are gloves, but of a variety more strange. Come to the wall here. To you I show them. See? It is most ingenious. So, the iron gloves open. And into them were the hands of the prisoner put. Uh, may, may I try them? It would all make it seem so real. But why not? Here. Your hands you place inside. Uh, like this? Yeah. And then. Oh, you've closed them? <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, most, most interesting, but uh, it's rather uncomfortable standing here against the wall with my hands chained over my head. So, if you don't mind... But that is only half of it. <laughs> All you have not yet seen. I pull back this lever so... Ah, and slowly, slowly the stones of the floor under your feet move away. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> Until you are hanging above a pit that goes down, down into the deepest depths of the castle. <laughs> and there you shall hang. <laughs> I shall hear you. 
Until ready I am to pull the lever that the chains will release. And down you will go. Don't touch that lever, Leonard. He's reaching for it. Quick, Watson. Ah! Good work, Watson. Just in time. It's, it's everything all right, Mr. Holmes. I, I, I watched the corridor, as you told me. Quite all right, Schiller. Just reverse that infernal device and let's release Miss Atterbury. Oh, thank you so much. Are you all right, Miss Atterbury? Quite. <laughs> Although it was not an experience I should care to repeat. I can well believe that. But there's nothing wrong with your courage, madam. <laughs> I believe I'd like a cup of tea. Well, we'd better get this fellow to the hospital, Holmes. I got him through the shoulder. Nothing fatal, but he's losing a lot of blood. Well, I will carry him, Mr. Holmes. Oh, oh. I, I will take him to the hospital. Oh. Go ahead, Miss Atterbury. Oh, I'll you. hold the torch. I realize, Holmes, that the man was mad. That a trap you set finally brought his madness out into the open, but... Uh, it was the only way, Watson. A long shot, but a successful one. I can't understand what Langer was uh, attempting to gain. I imagine, Watson, that his mind had become twisted by his many years among his gruesome exhibits of the past. And his hatred of young Scheller, Schiller, both as a prospective son-in-law and as a successor to his own position, must have hatched this mad plot. Well, it all ended well due to your foresight, Holmes, and to your pluck, Miss Atterbury. Oh, very good show, I must say. <laughs> it is a pleasure. Uh... Tell me, Dr. Watson, I believe that Mr. Holmes said that you and he are leaving tomorrow morning uh, for a trip down the Rhine before your return to England. Uh, you're not by any chance going aboard the steamer Earl Kearney, are you? Well, uh, yes, yes, we are. Oh, how very fortunate. <laughs> Miss Simpson and I are going on the same boat, uh, so we shall all be shipmates for a delightful week. Oh, yes, 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 D delightful. Um, are you a bachelor, Dr. Watson? A bachelor? Uh, yes, yes, I, I am. The Rhine scenery, they say, is most romantic. Yes, so I've heard. Uh, so I've heard. Uh, just a moment, Holmes. My, yes, Watson? Uh, my, my shoelace has come undone. You go on ahead, Miss Atterbury. We'll, we'll catch up with you in a minute. All right. Don't be long. I say, Holmes, you take her back to the hotel. Uh, I've got something else to do. Um, going to change our tickets, Watson? Huh? Uh, how do you know? I thought you might be thinking of giving up the Rhine trip and getting out of Germany by the fastest train. A brilliant deduction, Holmes. Elementary, my dear Watson. Elementary. Ladies, when you want your hair to look its radiant best for an important date... Just do this the night before. Give your hair a ten-minute glamour bath with Cremel Shampoo. I certainly agree with that, Mr. Bell. And you know, Cremel Shampoo is the same shampoo used by those famous beauties, the Powers Models. Cremel Shampoo has been especially developed to glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural, dazzling highlights. It leaves the hair simply gleaming with natural, glossy luster. And what's more... Your hair stays that way for days. And please bear in mind that Cremel Shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's not a drying detergent. Not a harsh soap. It's entirely different. Yes, Cremel Shampoo uncovers all the natural highlights that lie concealed in every woman's hair. Yet it never dries the hair. In fact, Cremel Shampoo has a built-in oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. It removes dandruff flakes the first time you use it. Cremel Shampoo whips up a luxuriant, active foam, even in the hardest water. It rinses out so easily and never leaves any dull, soapy film. So, ladies, why not buy a bottle of Cremel Shampoo at any drug counter and glamour bathe your hair to a vision of shining beauty, like the lovely million-dollar Powers models? K-R-E-M-L. Cremel Shampoo. Well, Dr. Watson, I'm afraid that this will be our last visit for a while. Yes, I'm afraid so, Mr. Bell, but it's been a pleasure to be with you and our listeners for so many weeks. And I hope you've enjoyed hearing my stories of the adventures of Sherlock Holmes as much as I have telling them. I think I speak for all of us when I say that we certainly have. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bell. You know, Dr. Watson, beginning one week from today, Cremel will present a new series of programs featuring Eddie Duchin. To be heard Monday, Wednesday, and Friday afternoons over the most of these ABC stations. 
Consult your local newspaper for the time. I'm sure that they will be very fine programs. And before saying goodbye for the summer on behalf of Tom Conway and myself, I'd like to thank all of those whose assistance has made our weekly visits possible. Claire Wiedener of the American Broadcasting Company. Carl Hefferman, our engineer. Bill Verdier and Vic Livoti, who so capably furnished our sound effects. Shirley Wilson, our charming script girl. Alex Steinert, who composed and conducted the music. Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher. Edith Miser and Leonard Lee, who wrote the dramatizations. And last, but not least, our producer and our director, Tom McKnight. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Final Problem. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of Universal International Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo and wishing you a happy and prosperous summer. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Welcome back. Well, you just know that uh, a mystery uh, uh, series with uh, Sherlock Holmes has to end, uh, at least the dramatic part, on that elementary my dear Watson line. Uh, a somewhat creepy case, but uh, one of those where there was no actual uh, murder committed. But overall, pretty decent uh, conclusion for uh, Nigel Bruce and uh, Tom Conway. Uh, Bruce actually uh, continued to have a career he in Hollywood making films and uh, appearing on uh, television until he took ill in late 1953. And Basil Rathbone was actually working to bring Sherlock Holmes to the stage uh, but Bruce was unavailable uh, due to his illness, and he passed away during the uh, rehearsals. But the memory of uh, him as Dr. Watson still endures to this day. Well, that will do it for this week and for this uh, series of Sherlock Holmes. Next week, we'll be back with another episode of Sherlock Holmes, but it will be on another on a new network with a new sponsor with new stars and recorded from a new city so we'll have a lot to talk about next week uh, and join us tomorrow for yours truly johnny dollar and uh, remember uh, we encourage you to support the show support.greatdetectives.net to be part of the campaign uh, donations must be in by this coming saturday if you uh, have itunes be sure to rate the show over on itunes and follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And if you have a comment, send it to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.